Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Of the many gifts passed on to us from the ancient Greeks and Romans, their myths are surely one of the most enduring and vivid cultural legacies. Though produced in a society different than ours in almost every conceivable particular, being unabashedly patriarchal, unapologetically slaveholding, and unquestioningly polytheistic, the myths of the ancient Greeks and Romans are nevertheless some of the most familiar stories to us and lie at the heart of the whole Western literary tradition. This is not the case with the myths of other cultures, as, say, for instance, with Native American or Polynesian mythologies, which often make their way into current anthologies of world literature, but which nonetheless strike us as altogether outré. The Trojan horse, on the other hand, the labors of Hercules and the flight of Icarus are myths as familiar to us as they are enduring. Yet despite their endurance throughout the millennia, or perhaps because of it, the classical myths are not in the least stagnant, since each new generation of artists, writers, and philosophers, right up to our modern age, have reimagined these tales of the ancients and have drawn fresh inspiration from their ever-colorful, ever-poignant depictions of the human condition, whether it be in the expression of psychoanalytical theory through the metaphor of Oedipus, the recasting of Odysseus's wanderings amid the humdrum world of turn-of-the-century Dublin, or the illustration of the tragic condition of man in post-war Europe, heaving like Sisyphus the boulder of existential sufferings up and down the hill of an absurd and pointless life. Moreover, this dynamic quality of classical mythology was present from its very beginnings, as the plasticity of Greek myth has often been remarked upon. For amongst the scattered and locally based cults of archaic Hellas, there was no possibility or even interest in obtaining one true version of these tales about the gods and heroes. There was no authority concerning speech about the gods, and the myths, which were the special prerogative of poets, were remade every time they were sung. Thus diverse traditions about the same myths developed, even the greatest systematizers among these bards, Homer and Hesiod, did not carry their versions into being, in a strict sense, canonical, since the pagan Greeks, though they came to have books, never had a book. It is exceedingly difficult for inheritors of a Christian <clears throat> revealed church tradition to recapture a frame of mind that arranged belief according to occasion or setting, but such indeed was the character of classical myth. In time, though, individuals began to challenge these received traditions, some discarding them altogether as false, others scavenging them for deeper truths through allegorical interpretations, and ultimately yet others who, as Christians, despised the gods, which were the central characters in these tales, yet who nevertheless were able to read them as beautiful literary creations with an embedded moral message that could be enlisted to support Christian doctrine. We will examine these ancient myths together and these all these various ways of reading them, starting from their uh, earliest origins with Homer and Hesiod and going on throughout the classical period, the Hellenistic period, and then into these various ways of reading of allegorical interpretations of um, uh, kind of rational, rationalistic reinterpretations of them, kind of trying to get at the kernel of historical truth in them, uh, that certain ancient authors and thinkers uh, employed, and then ultimately the, to the Christian reception of these classical myths. And it is hoped that by this approach, we will learn not only the details of their specific characters, plots, and settings, but that we will also take away something as well of their universalizing quality, which makes them so attractive and timeless. Indeed, because of the perennial appeal of these traditional stories about gods and heroes, modern audiences are exposed to a steady supply of mythical, <clears throat> and mythically inspired popular and, and highbrow culture in a variety of media, from animated movies to operas. With surprising regularity, however, modern audiences also still turn directly to an ancient source for their myth. Somewhere in the world right now, a play, say, of Euripides is being staged. The appearance of new translations of Homer's epics can still cause critical and popular stirrings and sell a lot of books. 
and of course visitors to museums gaze daily in rapt fascination at Greek and Roman sculptures and painted vases depicting mythical figures. We will explore these original sources in our course together as well, both material sources such as ancient vases and frescoes, but of course primarily literary sources that have survived from the ancient world. Yet, before we can explore any of these, there are three things that I would like to accomplish in this introductory part of our lecture. In uh, introductory part of our first lecture. In particular, I want to start off by defining the terms classical, mythology, and most importantly, but most difficultly, myth itself. And then I want to look at some of the problems and difficulties inherent in studying classical mythology. And finally, briefly, I want to describe the approach I will be taking in this course and what I'm going to be doing with these lectures as we look at classical mythology. Let us start then with some definitions. What do we mean by classical mythology? Well, the term classical in this context refers to the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. Now, those are two separate cultures, separated from one another, not only by location, obviously Italy and Greece, and by language, since the Romans spoke Latin and the Greeks Greek, but also separated from one another by time in regard to the high, their high points. Greek culture reached its zenith in the 5th century in Athens, while classical Roman culture uh, reached its apogee in the 1st centuries BC and AD. So there is a gap there of several hundred years between the high points of these two civilizations, and yet we talk about their mythology as a single unit, classical mythology. Why? Well, we can do that because while they are two separate cultures, there is a strong relationship between the two in their literature, their art, and particularly their mythology. Roman culture borrowed, or perhaps adopted would be a better word, a great deal of its mythology wholesale from Greek culture. Therefore, the myths that developed in ancient Greece were taken over by the ancient Romans. This makes it possible to discuss not just Greek mythology or Roman th mythology, but classical mythology as a unified whole. In this course, I will probably find myself using the term Greek myth and classical myth more or less interchangeably, simply because the myths did originate in Greece and were later adapted by the Romans. There are some exceptions to that, but that was generally how things happened. And we will have occasion throughout the course to look specifically at what the Romans did with Greek myth when they adapted it. So much then for the term classical. What about mythology? Well, the term mythology is actually rather ambiguous. Strictly speaking, it ought to mean the study of myth, right? Since ology uh, at the end of a word simply means the logos of that thing, the rational inquiry into the structure of that thing, just as biology is the rational inquiry or study of life, psychology, the study or rational inquiry of the mind, geology, the study of the earth, and so on. So mythology ought to mean the study of myth. And in fact, some scholars do use the term in that way. Properly speaking, that is what it ought to mean. Yet in common usage, mythology tends to mean the whole body of myths told by a particular culture. Someone says to you, for instance, uh, I've been reading a lot of Norse mythology lately. You don't assume that that means that that person has been reading theoretical statements about the myths of Norse culture, or that that person has been reading examinations of those myths. You tend to believe that that person has been reading an anthology of Norse myths. And mythology uh, is oftentimes used in this way. So it does have those two separate meanings, both the study of myth and simply the whole body of myth developed within a particular culture. I will use the term both ways in these lectures. We are doing mythology in the first sense. We are studying myth. But I will also frequently refer to classical mythology or Greek mythology, meaning the whole body of myths as developed in that culture. If mythology <clears throat> is the study of myth, then, or the whole body of myth as developed by a culture, what then is myth? Well, now that is a question that has no easy or obvious answer. The attempt to define myth is very difficult, actually, since myth is a notoriously hard concept to define, as we will see in detail in the next lecture, wherein we will look at several theories about myth. For this lecture now, I want to just give you a basic working definition to start with, a definition that I have worked out over years of teaching classical mythology to college students. And I define myth as a working definition to start off with, as traditional stories that a society tells itself 
that encode or represent the worldview, beliefs, principles, and often the fears of that society. Now, <clears throat> every single term of that definition could be argued with, and there are some scholars who no doubt would disagree with every one of them. But just as a working definition to start off with, I think it is useful. Myths, in my definition, are traditional stories or tales. Now, right away, that needs a little fine-tuning. Many scholars subdivide traditional tales in any society into three further subcategories, myth, legend, and folktale. In that division, myth, or we might say myth proper, as it is sometimes called, would refer only to stories <clears throat> that have to do directly with the gods. A story about Zeus's rise to power, for instance, would be a myth in this threefold division, whereas a story about Oedipus, Odysseus, or Achilles would not be, because they are human beings and not gods. In this threefold division, legend would refer to traditional stories rooted in historical fact, describing adventures of people who once actually lived, but whose adventures have been greatly exaggerated through the passage of time. So in our culture, Robin Hood would be an example of a legend. Uh, taking a more recent example closer to home, George Washington has all sorts of legendary stories that have accrued to him. There is no doubt that there was an actual George Washington, and yet many of the stories we tell about him, like his chopping down of the cherry tree, his throwing of a silver dollar across the Potomac River, these sorts of exploits have more to do with the symbolic function that we want George Washington to fulfill in our society than with anything that the historical man George Washington actually did. And so given enough centuries, he could become purely legendary. The third division, folktale, would refer to stories that are primarily entertaining and that often involve animals, very frequently talking animals, or clever human beings. Not exceptional human beings, common people usually, who are particularly clever in one way or another. Folktale is also referred to as fairy tale, though that is often a misleading term because these stories do not have anything to do with fairies whatsoever. Uh, an example of a uh, fairy of a folk tale, or fairy tale for that matter, would be Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and that kind of thing. So these three categories of traditional tales, these subdivisions into myth, legend, and folk tale, are useful. They can sometimes be very helpful in determining what kind of a story we are dealing with. But at least in classical mythology, these categories overlap to such an extent that the distinctions seem rather artificial. We have stories in classical mythology that combine elements of all three, myth, legend, and folktale. Uh, some of the most famous works of literature, for instance, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are impossible to categorize in this system as either myth or legend because they partake of elements of both. In this course, then, we will be looking at traditional stories that would count as legend according to the scheme, and we will even see several examples of uh, what could be called folktale elements within the traditional stories that we look at. I tend to use the word myth, therefore, as a, in a broader sense, and as a broad, as a wider category to account for all three types of traditional stories. Well, then, if myths are traditional stories, and as I say, traditional stories that a society tells itself about itself, then the next question must be, which societies use myth and why do they use it? Well, the answer to that first question is very easy. All societies use myth. That seems to be a given of human culture. I don't think there has ever been a society that did not have some sort of traditional stories, uh, traditional tales, but myth has a, an importance in pre-literate cultures that is lost in modern, highly literate, highly technological Western culture. And a note about that term pre-literate. I say pre-literate rather than illiterate because illiterate has a pejorative connotation. It sounds like that culture ought to be able to read and write, but is just too dumb or lazy to have managed to, to figure that one out. Uh, pre-literate, therefore, is more accurate because it indicates more precisely the status of the culture. A culture may be very sophisticated in certain ways, but it has not yet developed writing. And we will see, actually, that that is precisely what Greece was like before the 8th century BC. In a pre-literate culture, myth has an importance, as I say, that it does not have in a literate culture. And the reason for that, I think, is because in a literate culture, 
We have all sorts of different forms of explanation, of analysis, different windows for looking at the world and human experience that have developed after the invention of writing. For instance, we have psychology, we have history, we have science, we have a whole cornucopia of approaches uh, if we want to ask ourselves the sorts of questions that myth also asks itself, such as why does the world work the way it does? Why are physical entities as they are? How can human beings get along better? Why are there two sexes? Why do the two sexes have so much trouble getting along with one another? These sorts of questions, which myth, of course, focuses on, we, and, and when I say we, I mean anyone in a literate culture, can approach through any one of a number of avenues. Take that last one. In our culture, we might ask ourselves, why is it that men and women have had such, well, do have such a hard time getting along with one another? Well, we could turn to psychology, we could turn to biology, to science, we can, if we like, turn to philosophy. We have all sorts of avenues uh, to look at, to explore, to discuss, to analyze that kind of question. But in a pre-literate society, what means do they have for discussing such issues? If they do not have a sophisticated, long-lived literate tradition out of which these different disciplines can grow, what do they have? The answer is they have traditional tales, or if you like, myths. In other words, in a pre-literate society, all the functions that these different ologies and osophies that I have just been talking about have to fulfill and must be fulfilled in a pre-literate society only by traditional tales. Students often are very surprised when I say that. But if you think about it for a moment, I think you will see that it is so. How can a culture that does not have writing pass down its belief system, its values, its traditions, its histories, its view of the world, its view about the gods and about humans? The only open means is traditional word of mouth, repeated knowledge handed down from one generation to the next. And that knowledge is almost always put in the form of stories, probably for ease of remembering it, but also for the power that stories have. Uh, you know, a philosophical treatise is is a very rarefied thing. Most people will never read them. But everybody likes a good story. Everybody, and there's a power to mythology. There's a power to stories. They grip the mind and they, they touch the heart. And now this has important implications for the question that I am frequently asked in the classroom. What does myth really mean? Well, in modern Western, or at least modern American culture, we tend to make a very strong distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, real and imaginary, literal and metaphorical. That is, in fact, one of the main analytical tools we use for thinking about anything. It is one of the first things we ask of any story. Um, of course, most stories now come to us through television and movies rather than through books, but that doesn't matter to the point I'm making. One of the first things we ask about any stories is, is this true or is it fiction? Is this biography or is it a novel? But in a culture in which traditional tales are the only available form of explanation and the only for available form of analysis and of thinking about reality, if you want to put it that way. These distinctions can't be anything so, uh, as so clear-cut. The question, what does myth really mean? Or the question, what does the story really mean? Become anything but simple. Let me give you an example uh, of this phenomenon from Greek mythology itself. In our third lecture, we will start talking about the creation story of the Greeks, as told by... Uh, one of the authors that I've already mentioned, Hesiod. And in that story, we will encounter two entities, two deities, if you like, named Gaia and Uranos. <clears throat> Gaia is a goddess, Uranos is a god, and they have volition, they have desires, they have speech. They mate with one another and produce children. They therefore are anthropomorphized, human-like entities, male and female. Yet Gaia is simply a word that Greek in Greek means earth, and Uranos is simply a Greek word that means sky. Gaia is the earth. If you go outside and stamp your foot on the ground, you are stamping on Gaia. Uranos is the sky. All you have to do is go out and look up, and there he is. And students will very frequently raise their hands and say, well, which is it? Which is Gaia? Really, is she the earth or is she a goddess uh, with arms and legs, mind and speech and so on? And the answer, although perhaps infuriating, is simply yes. 
because that is the only answer possible. She is envisioned as really being both of those things. So the distinction we tend to make between metaphorical and literal is not really uh, applicable here. It would be a mistake to assume that Hesiod and his audience, when, when Hesiod talks about Gaia and Uranus, felt it as a metaphor in the same way that one does today when we speak metaphorically, say, of Mother Nature or something like that. Gaia was a goddess, but at the same time, also Earth. Greek mythology, like other mythologies, developed in a preliterate culture, as I said. This means that if we set out to study Greek mythology or classical mythology, we are setting ourselves up for a very paradoxical task. In, it developed in a preliterate culture, and uh, but what do we do when we study Greek myth? We study it through literature that has been written down. We have to. That is our primary access to it. Our main access to myth comes through written literature. Modern scholars of myth very frequently turn to modern preliterate societies to try to figure out what myth is and how it works. You see, kind of like a um, comparative anthropological approach. And this anthropological approach to myth is one of the more fruitful ones in the modern world of, of myth study, of, of the theoretical study of myth uh, that exists. And we're going to be learning all about the kind of uh, pioneers of that in our next lecture. In this anthropological approach, scholars go to live in cultures, talk to living representatives of those cultures, write down what representatives tell them about their myths, get a sense of how myth works in its native habitat. They can study myth as a living element of a living culture. When we talk about classical myth, however, when we want to look at the myth of the ancient Greeks and Romans, in effect, we are trying to do anthropology, anthropology backwards in time. We are trying to do anthropological observation on a culture that has no living representatives. This is a very frustrating and very difficult task. Obviously, I think it is worthwhile and it is worth undertaking, but there are some difficulties and problems inherent in it that we need to bear in mind throughout this course. What, for instance, are our sources for doing this backwards-in-time anthropology? Most obviously, as I say, literature. The literary works that have survived from ancient Greece and Rome that, are, that recount the myths of those cultures. And to supplement literature, archaeology comes into the picture. We can supplement archaeological artifacts, remnants of buildings, for instance, artwork, vases, and so on. Both of these things, however, that is both literature and archaeology, present formidable problems for trying to reconstruct what Greek and Roman myths were in their living environment. Let us consider each of these in turn, starting with literature first. Even in as well-documented and well-studied a society as classical Greece, the written versions of myths involve several problems from, for a scholar of myth. First of all, myths are frozen. Written myths are frozen things. And by that, I mean, once a version of a myth is written down, it is fixed. There it is. And we, as literate people, have a strong tendency to assume that that means that that version is somehow the myth, the real myth, the only way the myth was ever told. But that is not how traditional tales work in any oral setting. Uh, if I were to ask one of you right now to tell me the story of Little Red Riding Hood, I would get as many slightly different versions of that story as there are people responding. That is how a living oral tradition works. However, once a story is written down, when our access to it is through writing, we tend to assume that that is the real story. I can give a very clear example of what I mean by this. Uh, everybody knows the story of Oedipus the king, how he killed his father and married his mother without knowing who they were. When he discovered the terrible thing that he had done after his mother hanged herself, Oedipus blinded himself, went into exile, and never returned home to Thebes again, right? <laughs> well, right according to Sophocles' play Oedipus the King. But in the Odyssey of Homer, there is a very brief reference to Oedipus, which agrees that, yes, he killed his father and married his mother. Yes, his mother killed herself after the truth came out. But Oedipus, says Homer, continued to rule in Thebes for many years thereafter. Indeed, even in a different play by Sophocles himself, we see variations of the details, as, for instance, when we are told in his Antigone 
that Oedipus died wretchedly in shame as a wanderer on the earth. However, in Sophocles' much later play, Oedipus at Colonus, the final scene is of Oedipus being taken up into the heavens by the gods as a king or sort of semi-divine figure, um, which is the real version of the Oedipus, uh, Oedipus myth. They all are. Sophocles' version, as found in Oedipus the King, dominates our understanding of the myth because, A, it is such a marvelous play and so famous, um, and B, it has exerted such a strong influence, especially in the 20th century with Freud's Oedipal theory. Uh, but uh, And so it therefore overshadows all the other versions, but those other versions definitely still exist. As, as I pointed out, even within the other writings of Sophocles himself, so this is the kind of thing that we have to be on guard against. Often we only have one version of a myth in mind, but we have to remember that there were probably others. Another problem in studying myth through literature is that myths were the givens of a society. Were, they were something that everybody knew. And so very frequently authors will make the briefest possible allusion to a myth without explaining what it means or who it is. I did this myself a few moments ago when I referred to George Washington. I didn't have to tell you who George Washington was. I didn't have to tell you where he was born, where he died, what he did, whom he married. You know all that. He is a given of our society. However, a scholar a thousand years from now, 2,500 years from now, uh, in the future, um, if all they had were the references, if all that scholar had were references to George Washington that that uh, I or anyone else made elliptically, as I just did, it would be a very difficult thing to reconstruct who George Washington was if all they had were those kind of scattered references. They wouldn't. They would have a very hard time trying to figure out what he did. What was that bit about the cherry tree? Uh, you know, <laughs> why was he important? That is a very difficult thing. Uh, that a great difficulty that we have when we approach myth through literature. A perfect example of what I'm referring to here occurs in Book One of the Iliad, where the hero Achilles speaks to his divine mother, the goddess Thetis, and asks her to approach Zeus for a favor. He says that Zeus will grant her re this request because of something she had done for him once before. She had done something for Zeus. He says, if you are able, guard your own son. That would be Achilles. So Achilles is talking to his mother, saying, if you're able, guard your own son. Go to Olympus and make prayer to Zeus. If ever you have gladdened his heart by word or deed. For often I have heard you glorifying, uh, that is glorying, boasting in the halls of my father, and declaring that you alone among the immortals warded off shameful ruin from the son of Kronos, lord of the dark clouds, on the day when the other Olympians wished to put him in bonds, even Hera and Poseidon and Pallas Athena. But you came, goddess, and freed him from his bonds when you had quickly called the high Olympus, I'm sorry, when you had quickly called to high Olympus him of the hundred hands, whom the gods call Briarius, but all men Igaion, for he is mightier than his father. He sat down by the side of the son of Kronos, that is Zeus, exulting in his glory, and the blessed gods were seized with fear of him, and did not bind Zeus. Bring this now to his remembrance, sit by his side, and clasp his knees. And then the, then the scene goes on. The reference is very natural in the scene, just as one would speak about something to somebody who already knew all the details, like George Washington. But the problem is, we have no idea what this is referring to. Uh, besides this little casual anecdote, this myth is totally unknown to us. Um, the closest parallel is a revolt against Zeus by the Titans, which we will read in Hesiod. But here it is the other Olympians who are revolting against Zeus, Hera, uh, who is the wife and sister of Zeus, Poseidon, and Athena. Um, and in short, as the famous commentator and scholar of Greek myth, G.S. Kirk, remarked about this passage, quote, much remains obscure, <laughs> end quote. Another problem is that only a fraction of ancient Greek literature has survived. Indeed, most of what was written in the ancient world has been lost, and what has survived does not tell us what we particularly would like to know. Uh, these texts were not written for us, so they don't give us the details uh, that would be most helpful to us. And I'll, I'll just speak about this a little bit more. It is estimated that of all the literature, 
that was written in the ancient Greek and Roman world, only about 10% still exists now. And that is a remarkable, we, we have a lot, but that is a remarkably small fraction compared to the whole. Uh, why was it that it did not, uh, it does not exist? Well, it is, I'll, I'll tell you one thing it was not because of. It was not because of the commonly held myth. Uh, there is a different usage of the word myth, maybe we'll talk about later. Commonly held myth that it was because Christians in the early Middle Ages, um, couldn't handle classical learning, so therefore they went around ransacking libraries and burning them down, like the Great Library of Alexandria. There was a rather pathetic movie that was made about 15 years ago or so called Agara, which basically tries to, you know, dramatize this. Uh, no, uh, in fact, all that needed to happen, in fact, the, the, the reason why we even have the classical literature that we do have is because monks in the Middle Ages all took great pains to copy the, these manuscripts over. No, the, the reason why so much has been lost is simply for, for the reason that if uh, all it took for something to not survive was for people to do nothing and the ravages of time would take care of the rest. In order for any manuscript from the, from ancient Greece, you know, let's say the 5th century Athens, in order for that to make it into uh, the pre you know, the early modern period when we have the printing press, let's say in the in the 1400s, and the only way that, or and then and then after that, the only way that for that to survive would be somebody every couple of generations, you know, definitely at least you know once every say sixty years or a hundred years or so, somebody who knew how to read and write, and there weren't the proportion of people who were literate in ancient Greece was actually very small, uh, probably no more than twenty five percent really uh, by the classical period. Um, so somebody had to who knew how to read and write had to take enough time to copy over the entire text. Uh, and then another person had to do that within the next, say, 60 to 100 years. And that process needed to go on. And if there were any fires, if there were worms eating up the pages, if there was, you know, whatever, somebody needed some paper to uh, light up the stove or something like that, you know, all sorts of things could happen. Wars and, uh, you know, and, and as I said, just nothing at all. If a person waited too long, that paper would molder away and it would be, you know, ancient papyrus was, uh, you know, made out of plants. And so... Uh, I mean, a modern day paper is due, but it didn't have any of the kind of like specialized treatment that modern day paper has. So you get the idea. The ravages of time would basically make sure that things just didn't survive. So we, it is amazing that we have as much as we do. Well, what about archaeology? I mentioned before that the archaeological record um, can uh, and literature can often shed light upon one another. However, archaeology is, if anything, even more difficult to use as a reconstruction of myth than literature is. An archaeological artifact by itself tells us little or nothing about a myth to which it may refer. A statue, a painting, uh, if we do not already know the stories upon which those items are based, we cannot extrapolate the stories from the artifacts themselves. The same is true for buildings. If we know a building was a temple in honor of a particular god, it may uh, be we may be able to come up with some idea of what went on in that building and how that particular god was honored. But if we don't have external evidence, and that, in the case of uh, of an ancient culture, means written evidence, if we don't have written evidence to explain the archaeology, then the archaeology itself uh, archaeology itself can often be close to incomprehensible. Uh, there is a joke, for instance, among classical archaeologists that whenever archaeologists have no idea what an object is for, they will always say, well, it is of, quote, clear ritual significance. <laughs> um, and uh, if we don't know what something was, it must have been used for some ritual that we just don't know about. You know, uh, that you can see, obviously, that explains nothing. And that is a problem that we come up against in the archaeological record over and over again, not knowing what things were for, not knowing uh, the stories behind the images, you know, my mother particularly likes to collect little figurines of animals. Um, you know, if some archaeologists were to find them uh, 2,500 years from now, uh, no doubt that archaeologist would assume that they have a clear ritual significance. But of course, that isn't the case. Um, and we can also be misled by references in literature to thinking we know what an archaeological building or artifact was for when we actually don't. Let's for a moment imagine that we are archaeologists 2500 years in the future excavating some great american city like washington dc and that we have as remnants of the english language um several novels of charles dickens two or three jane austen novels uh huckleberry finn 
and eight volumes of the 1925 Encyclopedia Britannica, including the volume G. Well, as we excavate Washington, D.C., we come across all sorts of small buildings, each one laid out on the same plan, and each one with large, clearly ritually significant golden arches in front of it. We have read our Charles Dickens and our Jane Austen. We've got volume G of the Encyclopedia Britannica. We know that Gothic cathedrals and churches featured arches. It is a little bit disconcerting that one uh, our, that our American novel, one of those American novels that we have, Huckleberry Finn, doesn't say anything about these little Gothic churches. But Mark Twain wasn't very religious, perhaps, and uh, he wasn't interested in something everybody already knew. So there you have it. McDonald's are Gothic churches. <laughs> now, that is a silly example, I know, but I think it, it is illustrative of a problem that the, the problem generally that we have when trying to reconstruct the ancient world. Um, very frequently, the written record is no closer a match to the archaeological record than that. We can think we know what we are looking at when in actuality we are looking at something entirely and completely different, but we have no way of knowing that. So where does that leave it? Leave us? Is this a hopeless endeavor? Should we just give up at this point and say there is no way we could possibly study classical mythology? Well, obviously, I don't think so. I think we just need to bear these difficulties in mind and be cautious as we start our survey of classical mythology. We need to remember that we are studying only particular variants of the myths. Sometimes we can reconstruct a fairly full version of how the myth must have operated in its original society uh, when we have all sorts of variants uh, to work with. Other times we can't. Other times we will have to use only one version of a myth and no others. Some references remain tantalizingly obscure. Sometimes we just don't know what a character's name is or a snippet of a story refers to. Occasionally, a work of art preserves what is clearly a very different version of a myth than the ones known to us by extant literature. Uh, for example, there is a beautiful classical Greek vase uh, with a depiction of a character who is very clearly Jason from the story of Jason and the Argonauts. And this, you see that in front of you here. Jason got the Golden Fleece after his voyage on the Argo. The Golden Fleece is there on a tree behind Jason. You can see that. There's the fleece there hanging. Um, yet in this painting, the dragon is either swallowing Jason or spitting him back out again. Jason is halfway out of the dragon's mouth. His arms and head are visible outside the dragon's mouth. And yet, in no written version of Jason's story that has survived for us, does the dragon eat Jason or attempt to eat Jason. The whole point is that Jason is helped by Medea, uh, who gives him a magic potion uh, so that he can overcome the dragon without being eaten. If this vase painting had not survived, we would literally not know that there had ever been a variant on, uh, of the story in which Jason was eaten by a dragon. And yet, because of the painting, that is this vase painting, we know this variant existed, but that is all we know about it. We have no written description whatsoever of this version of Jason's story. Therefore, we cannot recover all the versions of a myth. We also probably can never know all the nuances, all the resonances of a myth within its own society. Again, when I say George Washington, uh, that brings up all sorts of associations in our mind, elementary school plays. I particularly performed in a play about George Washington when I was in elementary school, the 4th of July, and so on. All of these things are there as free associations with the name George Washington. That kind of nuance, that kind of resonance is unrecoverable for us regarding classical mythology. We are not going to know that in uh, all its detail about any culture, probably other than our own, even um, even cultures that are that in, uh, that exist right now, unless we are really very familiar with them, unless we're bicultural, as the as the term sometimes is, uh, we won't know all of that kind of stuff. And so within these limitations, we can use what we know about classical society to shed light on its mythology, and we can use what we know about these myths to shed light on that society. Just to sort of summarize a little of what we'll be doing in this course and how I am planning to organize these lectures, 
There are three main points to mention here. First of all, and most simply, the lectures will provide you with familiarity with the primary classical myths that are covered in the readings that uh, we will be going over for this class. This is by no means a survey of all classical myths or even of all important classical myths. I've had to leave a very great deal out. But what I have tried to do is to pick representative important myths that will give you a good taste of classical mythology. Of course, this uh, course will familiarize you with many of the major characters, stories, and themes of classical myth. So most of the lectures will include a good deal of time spent with the primary sources to gain the relevant stories, the re relevant myths storyline, and other pertinent details. That will frequently entail different versions or variants of the myth when we have them, and discussing the implications of those variants for our understanding of how the myths work. The essential um, uh, stories that we will be going over will be taken from classical literature themselves itself from the primary sources. Um, secondly, these lectures will discuss the cultural aspects of these myths as they functioned in the society that developed them. That is, we will look at the myths in the context of ancient Greek and Roman culture. And I will talk about what the myths tell us about the belief systems of those cultures, what those cultures tell us about the meanings of the myth. Finally, we will consider in many of the lectures how well or how poorly the myths we are looking at match various theories about myth as a category, about myth with a capital M. And we will discuss the usefulness of various theories and theoretical approaches for our understanding of classical mythology. And so in conclusion, having sketched out a working definition of what myth is, and having talked about some of the difficulties of studying classical mythology, it is time for us to move on in our discussion to outlining the specific literary sources of classical mythology, which we will be reading. And to do so, uh, we will give a brief chronological sketch of Greek and Roman history, uh, but that will have to wait until the next lecture. Thank you.